So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Noam Chomsky. Thanks. Uh, after the introduction, I think maybe I ought to give a campaign talk for Jill Stein. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just well, I've, oh, I'm disciplined, so I'll talk about what I was asked to talk about, uh, which is uh, Iraq and the connection between Iraq and the so-called war on terror. Uh, there is a connection. It's pretty thin, uh, but it's been drawn. Uh, intelligence agencies have pointed out that they uh, can't detect any uh, real connection between uh, Iraq and the terrorist networks, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda and the rest, which isn't too surprising. Uh, but there is a connection, nevertheless, and it's been pointed out. Uh, namely, we can create a link if we want. Uh, and the best way to create the link would be by attacking Iraq. Uh, it's expected widely that if we do attack Iraq, that's very likely to ignite uh, uh, terrorist attacks, uh, maybe that are already being planned um, as a possible deterrent, and it's very likely to spawn a new generation of uh, terrorists who will be seeking uh, revenge uh, and also deterrence. And the deterrence is uh, not a slight uh, uh, matter. Uh, uh, those of you who've been following the international relations literature, I'm going to be very establishment in this talk. I'm only going to quote people right in the mainstream. Uh, people who've uh, been following it know that leading uh, scholars, uh, respected figures in uh, international relations, uh, have been pointing out for some time, in fact, well before Bush, uh, that, the, uh, that U.S. adventurism is uh, uh, stimulating a proliferation of weapons of mass destruction uh, as a deterrent. Uh, that's not just countries that are being specifically targeted for attack, uh, but others uh, who uh, are concerned about uh, deterring a state that seeks, I'm quoting now, unilateral world domination through uh, absolute military superiority and is becoming a menace to itself and the world under a radical nationalist leadership. I've been quoting Kenneth Waltz, a well-known figure in international relations, and uh, Anatol Yevin, who's the uh, senior associate of the Carnegie Endowment for uh, International Peace. Uh, that, uh, in fact, even uh, real hardliners uh, are expressing pretty serious concerns. So one of the uh, leading uh, military uh, and strategic analysts who's concerned primarily with the Middle East, Anthony Cordesman, who's about as hard line as you can get within anything that might be called the spectrum of sanity. Uh, he's been uh, warned, he warned recently against uh, what he called the neoconservative fantasies of the sillier armchair strategists uh, and their plans for reconstructing the Middle East and maybe the world. He was referring to, to uh, Richard Pearl and uh, 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 Douglas Fife, but that also includes uh, Wolfowitz, uh, Rumsfeld, uh, others, uh, who all happen to be very close to the extreme right wing in Israel. So you're getting quite a lot of clear and good reporting from the mainstream Israeli press about them. Uh, as maybe you know, Richard Pearl, um, uh, who's very close to the center of planning now, and Douglas Feith were writing uh, position papers for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's new foreign minister, who's well to the right of Ariel Sharon, you know, so uh, they were doing that in the 1990s, and that's their connections and uh, contacts. And it's not understandable that even a, a hardline uh, a military analyst like Cordesman is uh, worried about their uh, sillier uh, proposals, which are in fact being thought about and maybe implemented. Uh, well, uh, why? That, that's about the only connection I know of between Iraq and terrorism at the moment. We can stimulate terrorism if we really intend to. Uh, uh, so why Iraq? I mean, obviously not in order to stimulate terrorism. Well, before going to that, i uh, begin with a kind of a truism, uh, which should be unnecessary to mention. 
Uh, in the case of uh, either the threat uh, of or resort to violence, uh, the burden of proof is always on those who advocate it. Uh, so that's true whether it's uh, domestic abuse or international affairs. Uh, and it's a heavy burden. And maybe there's an argument for it, but it's, the pers it's those who advocate force and violence who have to bear the burden, and it's a heavy one. Uh, you never need any arguments against the use of violence. Uh, that's automatic. You need an argument for it. It has to be a very strong one. Uh, that should be obvious, and I'll just put it in back. So why are, what, why are they, uh, why do they want to do it? Well, they're, uh, to, just to simplify, since time's brief, I'll pick uh, two views that are expressed pretty prominently uh, uh, in the mainstream, and I'll quote mainstream analysts. Uh, so here's the first interpretation. I'll start with uh, Yusuf Ibrahim in the International Herald Tribune a couple of days ago. Uh, he's a senior fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations and uh, was a senior Middle East correspondent for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal for about 30 years, so very recently moved to the CFR recently. Uh, his interpretation is that the goals of the Bush administration are basically two. Uh, one, uh, gaining short-term political advantage, and two, uh, I'm quoting him now, turning Iraq into a private American oil pumping station. Uh, well, there's a counter-argument to that against that in the New York Times yesterday, uh, maybe a response to it, I don't know, by Serge uh, Schmemann, who argues that uh, kind of disparages the oil uh, uh, relationship uh, on the grounds that uh, there's not going to be an instant bonanza uh, for Iraqi oil. Uh, it's true, but it's not a very persuasive argument. I mean, by the same argument, you can prove that uh, nobody was interested in Iraqi oil 80 years ago, or Texas oil, or Saudi Arabian oil, or Venezuelan oil, or certainly not Alaskan or North Sea oil. I mean, really expensive to get at. Uh, so by that argument, yeah, it's true, you're not going to get billions of dollars tomorrow, and it'll take development funds. Uh, but the argument is very weak. In fact, much weaker in the case of Iraqi oil, which is vast and relatively easily accessible uh, than it was in numerous other cases. So I think we can dismiss the counter-argument, uh, uh, which was, I think, a front-page story in the Times we can review yesterday. Well, that's Yusuf Ibrahim. Uh, uh, Yevon, who I quoted before, has a more detailed analysis along the same lines. Uh, he suggests that the Bush administration, the political aspect, is following, I'm quoting him, the classic modern strategy of an endangered right-wing oligarchy, uh, which is to divert mass discontent into nationalism uh, inspired by fear of enemies about to destroy us. And he speaks for many people in the world when he regards that as a the U.S. government's policies now as a menace to itself, meaning the country, uh, and to the world. Uh, well, September 11th provided a pretext uh, for um, resort to force, not just for the United States. That's uh, worldwide, and it was predicted at once. Uh, so um, the Russians in Chechnya, the Chinese uh, against their Western minorities, uh, Indonesia and Aceh, uh, Israel and the occupied territories, I mean, all over the world, uh, repressive uh, governments that were engaged in violent repression uh, used September 11th as a pretext to intensify it uh, under the guise of a war on terror and assuming correctly that they'd get a nod of approval uh, from the uh, boss in Washington. Uh, and it's not too surprising that the U.S. itself uh, would adopt the same uh, idea. So yes, 9-11 uh, uh, was a uh, pretext, and it was also used as a pretext uh, uh, to discipline uh, populations throughout the world, again, under the guise of a war on terror. And that ranges from the Central Asian dictatorships all the way over to the uh, more democratic countries, including our own. Uh, so the fact that September 11th would prove a pretext for uh, a, a war in Iraq is not a great surprise. And in fact, this was pointed out uh, also to pursue the um, um, uh, domestic uh, political agenda, as Levin points out, natural for an endangered right-wing oligarchy to do that, especially when it's carrying out a 
quite an extensive attack against the domestic population. It's not a big secret, or it shouldn't be. Uh, in the U.S., that was pointed out right away um, by, for example, by Paul Krugman and one of his con well-known economists and one of his regular uh, New York Times columns who reported right away that uh, literally before the dust had settled over the World Trade Center ruins, uh, influential Republicans signaled that they were determined to use terrorism as an excuse to pursue a radical right-wing agenda. And he and others have been documenting how they've been uh, following that course uh, ever since. Again, shouldn't be a secret, so I won't uh, pursue it. Uh, the uh, beast of Baghdad was then brought in to be an even more uh, terrifying threat. And there are also independent reasons. Uh, there is a long-standing goal, Ibrahim and others are surely correct, and it's kind of obvious. There's been, uh, it's been a long-standing goal to restore to uh, U.S. control uh, the second largest uh, oil reserves in the world. Uh, it's been recognized uh, ever since uh, the mid-40s, just quote the State Department in 1945, that this is a major component of what they called uh, a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history and a major theme of U.S. foreign policy since the Second World War has been to make sure that the U.S. Uh, uh, dominates it. France was expelled uh, on the interesting grounds that uh, it was an enemy state since it had been occupied by Germany, so therefore its contracts were void and England was slowly reduced to what the uh, foreign office calls a British Foreign Office calls a junior partner. Uh, the U.S. puts it differently. Uh, Forty years ago, a senior statesman, probably Dean Acheson, in internal discussion, described uh, Britain as uh, our lieutenant. The fashionable word is partner. And they like to hear the fashionable word, but the reality is the actual word. Uh, and control over Middle East oil has been a very large part of it from the Second World War. Uh, let me stress that it's control, it's not access. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about that. The United States really doesn't care much about access to Middle East oil. Uh, from uh, up until 1970, it didn't care at all. You know, North America was the bigger, biggest producer, but it didn't affect the need to control the region. Since then, its biggest importer has usually been Venezuela. If you look at U.S. intelligence projections, uh, for example, the National Intelligence Council uh, projections for the next 15 years, uh, they predict and suggest that the U.S. should rely on a more secure uh, Atlantic Basin uh, uh, resources, West Africa and Latin America. But that has absolutely nothing to do with control over Middle East oil. Now, that has to do with its being one of the greatest material prizes in world history, which means that whoever controls it and can have an effect on setting price and production levels, can also determine that the wealth, the vast amount of the wealth, flows right back um, here, and it does. Uh, it's independent of access to oil. A stupendous source of strategic power has nothing to do with access. That has to do, that translates as a lever of world control, and that's been recognized clearly since the 1940s, and it remains true today. Well, September 11th gave a pretext, uh, the domestic politics uh, affects the timing, uh, and the strategy has been working quite brilliantly. Uh, you see it right now in the midterm elections. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's, even, it's going to be even more important uh, next year, uh, presumably, if you put yourselves in, uh, say, Karl Rove's shoes, Bush's campaign manager. Uh, when the presidential campaign begins in a little over a year, uh, do you really want people to be thinking about uh, what's happening to their pension or how they're going to take care of their elderly mother or, uh, uh, you know, what's, uh, what about their job or, you know, why is, uh, why can't they get health care? Why is, what about an environment that their children uh, might live in? Uh, the, uh, you know, things like that are certainly not what they want uh, uh, people to be paying attention to. They want, they'll want people to be, you know, praise, singing praises to the brave cowboy who saved them from destruction at the hands of a colossal foe, you know, sort of Martian foe, and will by then be marching on to some new adventure. Uh, exactly as Gibbon says, that's the 
uh, tradition. That's the classic strategy of an endangered right-wing oligarchy, uh, which wants to divert mass content, which has plenty of ground, uh, into nationalism and fear. And it takes uh, a lot of work to uh, overlook the fact that uh, the only people who are afraid of uh, Condoleezza Rice's mushroom cloud, which is going to consume us imminently, uh, the only people who are afraid of it are Americans, uh, not the people of the region, for example. I mean, they're afraid, but they're afraid of the United States uh, more than they are of Iraq. Of course, Iraqis are afraid of Saddam Hussein, and they have every right to be, uh, but uh, that can't possibly be the reason for the uh, U.S. war. I mean, the uh, U.S. was supporting Saddam right through his worst atrocities, uh, helping him develop weapons of mass destruction right up to the day of the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, and it's the same people who are in running Washington right now. So whatever the reasons are, it's not that. Uh, the, uh, so yeah, they're, they don't, they're afraid of Saddam Hussein, but they also know that he can't do very much. Uh, in fact, very little. Uh, if he made a move anywhere, you know, Iraq would be um, obliterated. Uh, he knows that, and the people in the region know that. Uh, but uh, even the uh, U.S. press, the national press, which is usually highly supportive of uh, power, uh, now recognizes that, um, quoting the world, uh, is more concerned about the unbridled use of American power uh, than it is about the threat posed by Saddam Hussein. It's a lead story in the Christian Science Monitor a couple days ago, and it's been pointed out by others. So there's, there definitely is a security issue. Uh, there's a problem of securing uh, the agenda of the radical right-wing oligarchy and making sure that they can continue for another four years to uh, uh, undermine living standards, destroy social policy, concentrate the wealth uh, in a very narrow sector of an unusually corrupt part of uh, the business establishment, as Krugman and many others have been pointing out. And to pursue that, to secure that agenda is very serious. And it is a security problem, and that's about the only security problem uh, anyone can seem to conjure up. But it's real, of course. Well, that's one interpretation. Uh, one interpretation, well, within the mainstream establishment, uh, is what I just said. Uh, there's a long-term goal of regaining control over the second largest uh, resources in the Middle East and ensuring uh, domination of the greatest, one of the greatest material prizes in world history and a stupendous source of strategic power. September 11th gave a pretext, as it gave a pretext around the world for intensification of violence and disciplining of populations. And uh, domestic uh, considerations uh, and that very important security problem, uh, they uh, uh, probably account for the timing. So it has to be this winter, not next winter. That'll be too late. By then, we'll have been consumed by the mushroom cloud, which will avoid everyone else but hit us. Uh, and uh, the uh, and, and so uh, and of course, it's just kind of like an accident that that'll be the uh, right in the middle of the presidential campaign. Uh, just as it's an accident that the people of the region are afraid, but mostly of us, uh, and uh, joining much of the world in that. Uh, well, that's one interpretation. Uh, there, uh, incidentally, this, uh, all of this is not only the classic strategy of an endangered right-wing oligarchy under a radical nationalist leadership, as Levin points out, but it's also second nature to the people in Washington. Remember that the people running the show are recycled Reaganites, right? almost entirely. They come out of the Reagan administration when they were doing precisely the same thing. <coughs> I mean, the first thing, when they came into office, when the Reagan administration came into office 20, in 1981, uh, first thing it did was declare a war on terror uh, with pretty much the same rhetoric as today. Uh, at that time, uh, Americans had to be terrified by uh, uh, Libyan hitmen who were uh, wandering the streets of Washington uh, planning to kill our leader, another brave cowboy, uh, who was hiding in the White House surrounded by tanks. I mean, if you're old enough, you'll remember that, or your parents will. That was 20 years ago. Uh, and they had to be worried about the, the Sandinistas, who were only two days marching time from Texas, the brave cowboy told us. Uh, and they were following a script, uh, the script of Mein Kampf, 
uh, in their plan to conquer the hemisphere, if not beyond. Uh, that was George Shultz, the administration moderate, the Colin Powell of the day. Uh, and there was a national emergency called renewed every year because of the uh, threat to the US uh, security and uh, survival posed by people like that, for example, by Gaddafi, who was planning to expel America from the world, according to Reagan, or at least his speechwriters. And people were afraid. I mean, this is traditionally a very frightened society. You can ask about the reasons, but it's well known. Uh, Americans happen to be more frightened of almost anything than most other people. Uh, all kind of historical reasons, but it's clearly true. That can be crime, uh, you know, aliens, uh, drugs, <laughs> uh, you name it. There's a lot of fear, it's, it's, and it's, it's not hard to stir up fear among the population, and it was going on right through the 80s. Uh, so all of this is absolutely second nature to the guys making policy today, and it wouldn't be too surprising if that's what they're planning. Well, uh, my time's just about running out, but which is fine, uh, because there is another view, which I can fortunately skip since there's no time. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's what you hear every time George Bush or Tony Blair or someone who supports them uh, uh, reads from their note cards or maybe makes it up themselves. Uh, we can, uh, and you're familiar with that, so I don't have to repeat it. Uh, the, uh, just end with this. Uh, uh, we could run through the arguments, I don't know if it's necessary, but uh, uh, more interesting in a way is just to accept all the claims as true. So let's say everything they say is true, okay? Uh, if you can, then you can run a little experiment. It's pretty easy to show that if the claims are true, there are very simple ways to meet the announced goals. Uh, I'm not just talking about sending back inspectors, there are other ways if you decide that a war is necessary. Uh, measures that really haven't been considered. Uh, kind of instructive to ask why, but uh, I'll s stop there since time's running out. Well, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, we have four mics. Two down here, two up there. I would ask, if at all possible, that we allow students of Harvard undergraduate Kennedy School, students to uh, ask the questions first, if possible. I'd ask you to state your name and where you are here, and try to keep your questions short and end them with a question mark. And we have a linguist in the audience who can tell us if the question is, in fact, a question or not. So uh, why don't you come up and stand up here, and we'll start over here, and then we'll go around here. This gentleman right here. Go ahead. Hi, Professor. My name is Ryan Cunningham, and I'm a first-year student at the Kennedy School. Um, you sort of ended your speech with a, a big blank, <laughs> and I, I want to give you the chance to fill it. I'm very curious to know what else could the government, government be doing, and as private citizens, what can we really do to be effective in letting the government know how we feel? Government can do. Um, the easiest thing that the government can do is, it's, it's kind of like asking, um, if, suppose you had a battered wife in front of you. And you ask, well, what else can a husband do? Well, you know, one thing you can do is stop battering her. Okay, that's, that's one possibility. A pretty straightforward one. Uh, and as I said, the uh, burden of proof is all, you're asking the wrong question. The burden of proof is on those who advocate violence. You don't need an argument against them. Okay, they got to give the argument. So what can the government do? Well, it can do what the rest of the world wants, for example. It can stop uh, desperately trying to block inspections. And it can go along with allowing inspections. Okay, that's one thing it could do. If, it really if they really believe everything they're saying, and I doubt that they do, uh, there are other simple proposals. I mean, I could suggest a couple. They're never discussed, but there are simple proposals. But the easiest one is just to allow the inspectors back. They've done far more to uh, eliminate uh, Saddam's weapons than uh, bombing did or sanctions. I mean, the inspectors had a big effect. They're not going to find everything. You know, they'll, uh, in fact, you can't find everything. It's a lot, when Rumsfeld says, uh, well, they'll never, we can't be sure they'll find everything, he's surely correct. I mean, if a country has a high school biology lab, it probably has the capacity to develop biological weapons. Okay, so you can't, so the only way to find everything is destroy the entire country. Okay, uh, but uh, nuclear weapon development is very easy to detect. 
So if that's what anyone's concerned about, yeah, you can handle that. Uh, there's just uh, very, uh, the world's intelligence agencies are, have a very strong case when they say that uh, Saddam Hussein, the likelihood that he'll be involved in uh, um, inciting or even supporting terrorist acts is extremely low. If you're worried about uh, nuclear weapons being put together in a New York hotel room, uh, which is not impossible. In fact, there are technical papers in the literature four or five years ago uh, saying that things like that have a far higher probability of success than uh, a missile attack. If you're worried about that, then worry about the loose nukes in the world, uh, like in uh, former Soviet Union or in Pakistan, which is a really serious threat. But since the people in Washington aren't, oh, oh, they don't care about that threat very much, they're not doing it. Uh, so yes, there are, there are easy things to do like that. And then, as I say, there are also other, if, if war is necessary, there are simple, much easier proposals than what's suggested. Hey, gentlemen up here. Sir, my name is Rick Arthur. I'm a student here. Uh, I'd like to, I like to call you on your proof Rocky and call to inaction always. Um, you're, you're in, you advocated inaction uh, in the face of the genocide in Bosnia and in several other incidences that are similar to that. Can you refer to some place where I referred to inaction well, in Bosnia? Well, Bosnia was one. Well, can I, I, you refer to a place where I did that? You, you called for inaction. Can in, you mention a place where I referred Bosnia. for inaction? Can you, can you cite a source? Well, I, I, I don't have an information. No, you me. don't have one because none exists. Much what you're like, doing is paying attention to gossip that you hear from various uh, well, so columns. Speaking if you of think gossip, a, sir, I'd like, I'd like to call you on the light it. you bring to, 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 I'd like to bring you to the light you bear uh, when you talk about the damage that terrorism causes. Terrorism mm -hmm. causes uh, dramatic instability in the Pacific, it's caused dramatic instability in, mm -hmm. in, in New York, and that has economic, yeah. dire economic uh, causes or, 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 excuse me, effects. That's absolutely and, right. That's why I've been opposed to terrorism for years. I was uh, arguing against the, uh, I mean, 20, 20 years ago, 20 years ago I was writing about uh, the Reagan administration's uh, massive terrorist wars, and why I continue to do it your, up till today. Why don't you ask your, your question, though? That, I, uh, I, what, what, what concrete steps would you advocate the United States do as a superpower to combat terrorism, besides nothing? Right. Well, first of all, there, no, one easy way to reduce terrorism, the easiest possible way, is to stop participating in it. Uh, that already, uh, that, uh, that already, that already reduces it by a very substantial factor. Huge, in fact, right up to the present. I'll give you, if you don't know examples, I'll be glad to list them for you. Uh, second, uh, uh, if, if to talk about that small, much smaller category of terrorism that's directed against the West, okay, and it exists and it's serious, let's say Al-Qaeda style terrorism. Well, of course, one way to stop, uh, to reduce it is to stop fostering it. So remember where these groups came from. These are the groups that were organized, trained, and armed by the CIA uh, back in the 1980s and their associates to fulfill for reasons of state. They didn't care about Afghanistan. Um, as late as 1993, uh, after the first attempt to blow up the World Trade Center, which came awful close to succeeding, uh, Bill Clinton was uh, uh, sending uh, uh, Al-Qaeda members, or you know, at least Afghanis, Af Islamic radicals from Afghanistan along with Hezbollah people flying them to uh, Bosnia to fight the U.S. side in that war. Well, you know, that one way to, and we can go on with that. It, Bali bombing is another case if you want to look at it closely. So another way to reduce terrorism is to stop fostering and uh, organizing terrorists around the world. But let's take uh, the attacks against the United States, okay, like 9-11. How do you deal with that? Well, you know, uh, one way of dealing it is by bombing Afghanistan, uh, which as far as anyone, as, according to U.S. intelligence at least, had almost no effect on terrorism and may have extended it. Uh, that's U.S. intelligence. Uh, there are ways, however, to reduce threats like that, and we know what they are. Uh, they've been carried out. Uh, for careful police work. So for example, primarily in Germany, which is the leader in this, uh, police work has in fact broken up a very significant uh, uh, Al-Qaeda rings. And yeah, that's the way you deal with crimes. Uh, the other way you deal with them, and everyone knows this, uh, is by looking at the grievances. You want to deal with 
terrorism. Every serious scholar, the head of every intelligence agency, anyone who has a, their head screwed on, knows that you do with it by looking at where it comes from. Uh, if you want, I can quote for you the head of Israeli Shabak and the head of Israeli military intelligence and leading uh, uh, scholars uh, uh, here and so on. Yeah, they all say the same thing, uh, just as Britain finally found out. You want to deal with IRA terrorism, uh, there's no use, uh, wouldn't do any good to bomb Belfast or to bomb Boston, for example, where the financing came from. Uh, what made sense, at first they tried the violence, that just increased the terrorism. Finally, they started paying some attention to the grievances, which are quite real, and there's been some progress, and that's true uh, all over. So yeah, there are a lot of ways to deal with terrorism, but the main way is to stop participating in it. This gentleman right here. Hi. Um, okay, this is a good distance. My name is Shahe Wartanian. I'm an undergraduate. Um, before I say anything, I want to thank you for all your books you've written. They're quite prolific, and my friends and I, you know, we sit around reading them, and they're, we enjoy it very much. So. Sure, you got better things to do than that. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and uh, what I wanted to say was that um, I'm reading a number of articles on this question of whether you know we ought to go to war or not, and I. You know, I read a piece that said that, you know, Hussein has gone into the north and executed a lot of the Kurdish folks that are up there and that commits genocide up there and that uh, hmm. the link to terrorism resides with the fact that he gives $25,000 to the families of uh, suicide bombers so that there's a, there's a monetary link there. You were asking about a connection. So I would, um, I would say that it resides with yeah, the so two, those two that, things. So let's take those two things. Oh, I, I'm sorry, almost, go ahead. Yeah. It's, I'm almost out. Oh, okay, great, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's those two that he's um, that he's broken United Nations resolutions, yeah. undermined international on that the war with Iran and Kuwait that he's yeah, you know absolutely. destabilized the region and that it's yeah I'm familiar with your argument. Case for yeah. war. Yeah. So the what is the question? That, yeah. but, what does one say about those things? Yeah. yeah I mean, okay. So let's go through them. So it's perfectly true. Let's go back to uh, the main arguments that are given. I mean, uh, every speech of Blair and Bush and the British dossier, or well, let's take the New York Times a couple of days ago, uh, which had a big insert taken from the Kennedy School, incidentally, from a Kennedy School research project on crimes of Saddam Hussein. And what was charged is all correct. Uh, only one thing is missing in all of these accusations, three little words, with our support, okay? Yeah, he invaded Iraq, he used chemical weapons uh, in the war, uh, he uh, uh, used gas against what's called his own people. Uh, there are, the Kurds are his own people in the sense that the Cherokees were Andrew Jackson's people. <laughs> but yeah, he used, uh, he used gas against uh, the Kurds. Uh, he then carried out the Anfal, uh, Anfal massacre, which maybe killed 100,000 of them or so, uh, always with the firm support of the United States and Britain, okay? Uh, in fact, of the people who are now in charge, who don't even have the minimal decency to say, well, we did something wrong. What they do is leave out the words with our support, and everyone who reports it leaves out the words with our support, which continued, including uh, uh, giving him means to develop weapons of mass destruction, uh, missiles, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, biological and chemical weapons, and all that went on literally up to the day of the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, and in fact, he did invade Kuwait when he was a US ally. Uh, just as he invaded Iran when he was a U.S. ally. So yeah, he committed all of those crimes, and those are by far the worst crimes in his record, with our support. The next worst crimes on his record are in March 1991, after the war, right? After the Gulf War, when there was a Shiite uprising, which probably would have overthrown him. Uh, there were rebelling Iraqi generals who uh, didn't ask the U.S. for support. Remember, that's the time when the U.S. had total control of the region, total. You know, it's after the war. Uh, but the people who are now in Washington uh, decided to support their old friend Saddam. So they refused to allow uh, uh, rebelling Iraqi generals access to captured arms. They authorized Saddam to use uh, military helicopters and other weapons. And he killed tens of thousands of more people while they watched. And they had a reason, an official reason. They said the reason is because we need what's called stability. 
uh, we don't. We want to make sure that the Iraq doesn't break up. It was explained rather well by the uh, chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, well and approvingly, Thomas Friedman. He said, "Well, he said the best of all worlds for the United States uh, would be an iron-fisted military junta." ruling Iraq the same way Saddam did, but with a different name, because this one's kind of embarrassing. Uh, so that would, so and those are his worst crimes by far. Did he violate UN resolutions? Sure, you know, he's hardly the only one. Uh, actually, uh, people point out correctly that Israel's violated many more, but that's missing the point. Uh, the, if, if Iraq had the, I mean, think for a minute, if Iraq had the capacity to veto Security Council resolutions, it wouldn't be in violation of any of them. I mean, the main way to violate, the main way to violate Security Council resolutions is to veto them. Uh, and who's in the lead in vetoing Security Council resolutions? Uh, ever since the UN fell out of control with decolonization, so say since the 1960s, well, the US is far in the lead, Britain second, nobody else is even in shouting distance. Uh, and it's on all kinds of issues. So for example, the US is the only country on record as vetoing a resolution calling on all states to observe international law. Okay, uh, that was uh, af after the U.S. had rejected the World Court uh, ruling ordering it to stop its terrorist attacks against Nicaragua. So yeah, there are plenty of countries that have, are in violation of Security Council resolutions. That's true. Uh, does it have anything to do with attack on Iraq? No, nothing. Let's, uh, we got a lot of people standing. I would keep you up. But uh, I'm going to ask again. People ought to be students of Harvard, the T Kennedy School, if possible, because Otherwise, it's not fair to the other people who are here. Let me just add one word, because I forgot to talk about the alleged $25,000 to suicide bombers. That may or may not be true. I've never seen a source for it, but let's say it's true. Uh, before there were any suicide bombers, um, it was also reported by the same sources that Saddam Hussein was giving $10,000 to the families of uh, anyone who was killed by Israeli, atro by Israeli uh, atrocities, and there were plenty of them. Well, should he have been doing that? So let's take, say, the first month of the current intifada. Uh, I'm just relying now on IDF sources, Israeli army sources. Now, what they say is that in the first few days of the intifada, the Israeli army fired a million bullets. Okay, uh, One of the high military officers said that means one bullet for every child. Uh, within the first month of the intifada, they killed about 70 people Okay, uh, using US helicopters. Uh, and in fact, Clinton shipped new helicopters to Israel as soon as they started using them against uh, civilians. That's just the first month. And at that point, and it goes on, no suicide bombers. Uh, at the time, uh, it was reported that Saddam Hussein was giving $10,000 to every family. Well, is that supporting terror? I mean, it seems to me sending helicopters to Israel when they're using them to attack apartment complexes, that's supporting terror. Okay, that's just. Yeah, um, I, my name is Christy Lanzel. I have an aversion to bright lights um, protecting my eyes. Um, I wrote the only initiative on the ballot tomorrow, which refers to foreign policy. You signed it two and a half years ago. It calls on the US to pull its troops out of Colombia. My question concerns the political climate in Massachusetts, uh, the election tomorrow. It seems to me that all three initiatives on the statewide ballot meet the original meaning of the term reactionary and that they want to go back to the past. I want to ask you specifically about number two, uh, which would um, end bilingual education. It seems like Massachusetts Republicans have a policy that is more similar to the language policies of Francisco Franco and Benito Mussolini than of the Republicans in Texas. Yeah. Let's get, you are a student of Harvard, is that right? Uh, no, I'm unemployed and disabled. I, too, right? yeah. I mean, I'd be happy to talk about it sometime, but I don't think this is the right. Move. The elections tomorrow, would yeah, you like no, to say yeah. anything about that? N not unless it's, I think we ought to try to keep sort of to the topic. You yeah. know, we could do off in any. Okay, yeah. this lady right here. Lucy Nesbetta from the Kennedy School. Could you please uh, discuss the doctrine of Pax Americana as an organizing principle for US foreign policy? Uh, well, you, you're referring, for example, to the National Security Strategy report from a month ago. Uh, th that was a pretty brazen, which everybody knows it, so I don't have to repeat it. It was a pretty brazen statement, and it's uh, part of the reason why uh, much of the world, including Europe, uh, regards the United States as a menace to itself and the world, uh, to quote the event again. Yeah, it's part of the reason. It frightened the Europeans and others. On the other hand, if you think about it, uh, Colin Powell pointed out in a press conference right afterwards that it wasn't all that new, uh, and that uh, even the preemptive strike doctrine, he said, was not all that new, and he was correct. 
Uh, it's an old principle. And the U.S. didn't invent it, of course. It's just the U.S. is by far the most powerful state, so when it proposes it, it means something. Uh, but you can trace it right back uh, to the time when the U.S. became a major global power after the Second World War. And before that, it was also true, but in the region. Uh, that's called the Monroe Doctrine, in fact. Uh, it goes back to the, uh, in fact, uh, when Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy, 40 years ago, um, ordered his staff to unleash the terrors of the earth against Cuba, uh, escalating an already ongoing international terrorist campaign. Uh, the reason was that, uh, you can read it in the declassified record now, uh, the reason was that uh, the very existence of the Castro regime was a successful defiance of the United States and of a policy of 150 years that the United States had been following. Namely, it was the existence of a regime which was not following US orders. And they traced it back 150 years, so therefore we had to carry out a major terrorist campaign that goes right into the 1990s. Uh, so yeah, Colin Powell's correct, it's not new. Uh, and furthermore, it's even on the public record. You don't have to go to the uh, declassified record. So if we go back again 40 years, since I'm talking about the Kennedy School to the Kennedy administration, uh, in 1962, 62 or 63, right about then, 62 I think, uh, senior statesman and Dean Acheson and senior Kennedy advisor uh, gave an important speech to the American uh, Society of International Law. Uh, he was talking about um, the U.S. Uh, uh, economic warfare against Cuba, which was widely recognized as illegal, and by now every, uh, every relevant body, including even the normally compliant Organization of American States, has declared it to be illegal. Uh, but what, and uh, at the time, the terrorist war was already underway, but it wasn't that public, except, of course, Cubans who knew all about it. But uh, the, uh, and he, what he told the American Society of International Law, that in the case of a, uh, uh, in the case of a U.S. response, he said that no legal, I'm quoting it now, no legal issue arises, no legal issue, in the case of a U.S. response to a challenge to its power, position, or prestige. Okay, that actually goes beyond the, uh, uh, the Bush doctrine announced a month ago, and that's the other end of the spectrum. That's the Kennedy administration, okay? And that was public, like it's not secret. It's the American Society of International Law. Uh, and there are plenty of examples in between. The same is true of pre uh, preemptive strikes. Uh, so uh, the idea of a preemptive nuclear strike, which was kind of announced, you know, not in those words, but everyone understands it in the so-called Bush doctrine. It's also a Clinton doctrine. Uh, the have a look at uh, uh, a major, the major study of uh, Clinton's strategic command, which is from 1995. It's called Essentials of Post-Cold War Deterrence, partially declassified. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's the major document sort of uh, working out a post-Cold War strategy. Well, one of the things it advocates is what it calls preemptive response. A nice phrase, you know, think about it. <laughs> preemptive response, including nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states that have signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty, if considered necessary, okay? Uh, it also explains the background. It says uh, we have to convey a national persona of being irrational and vindictive. Uh, that, they say, will frighten people. Uh, in the professional literature of political science and international relations, there's a term for it. It's called establishing credibility. Uh, that's very important. You've got to establish credibility. You know, you want to know what that means, ask your neighborhood and mafia done. I'll explain to you what it means. Uh, you don't just collect protection money from somebody if they don't pay. You certainly don't ask for a court order uh, for it. What you do is beat them to a pulp. Uh, that establishes credibility. Then others know who's boss. And that's the way international relations work, too. So yeah, there's a direct precedent there, and you can trace it back quite far. There's this gentleman right here. Up there. Hello, I'm uh, John Mensing. I'm a first year MPP here at the Kennedy School. And uh, we've talked a lot tonight about the U.S.'s motivations here, um, you know, kind of cynical, but we'll accept them for the purpose of discussion. Uh, I, I really want to talk about the relevant question here is, uh, is, is the world going to be a better place if Saddam is out of power? Regardless of our motivations behind the, this regime, regime change, 
uh, you know, wouldn't we still be better off if this, you know, by all accounts, sort of nasty guy was out of power? Absolutely. We would also be better off if a regime was out of power, which is uh, regarded widely in the world, including Europe, as a menace to itself and to the world. Yeah, we'd be better off. And in fact, there are plenty of uh, uh, there are plenty of very brutal regimes around the world. Uh, would you want me to start naming them from A to Z? Yeah, plenty of them. Uh, Saddam Hussein is certainly a threat to anyone within his reach. Uh, just as he was when the current people in Washington were offering him lavish support and incidentally explaining the reasons. It had nothing to do with the Cold War, it had nothing to do with the war against Iran. Uh, it was because of our duty to support American exporters, as John Kelly, the uh, State Department head of the Near East, of Middle East Affairs, uh, 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 testified in the early 1990. Yeah, that's why we had to do it. And then he was a real danger. Uh, when we were, uh, so yes, it would be better, the world would be better off if a lot of regimes were out of power. I can list plenty of them, uh, and, and some of them are pretty close to home. Uh, but what does that have to do with this? I mean, if we want to get rid of Saddam Hussein, there are easier ways to do it. In fact, there are easier ways by war, um, a much easier way. Could you enlighten us on, on those yeah, easier I mean, ways? Probably an obvious one. I mean, I mean, let me suggest, point out before I even mention it that this suggestion is totally insane. Uh, its only merit is that it's a lot more reasonable than what's being discussed. Uh, so uh, one, one possibility is to unleash Iran. Uh, we can offer them uh, logistic support and uh, you know, missiles and bombing, all from a safe distance, let them do the fighting. Uh, that, uh, that has lots of advantages over what's being proposed. Uh, for one thing, uh, I'll just think about them for a minute. Uh, they, uh, I mean, there's no, they'll not only get rid of Saddam, they'll tear him to shreds and everybody who's anywhere near him. Uh, they'll uh, eliminate every trace of weapons of mass destruction, which really threaten them. And furthermore, they'll do it for any successor regime, which the U.S. won't do. Uh, so therefore, they'll make a real contribution to uh, disarmament in the region. And in fact, they'll even uh, live up to a paragraph of uh, the famous Resolution 687, uh, which is always omitted when it's reported, uh, namely the Article 14, which says that disarming Iraq should be part of general disarmament in the region. OK, that makes sense. And by disarming successor regimes to Saddam, yeah, there'll be a big help there. Another advantage is there won't be any American casualties. Okay. There won't be any Israeli casualties. Uh, nobody will be, you know, no point uh, shooting off scuds at a country, uh, at Israel, when its uh, prime enemy is invading. That would be ridiculous. So no casualties, that's fine. There are plenty of Iraqi and Iranian casualties, but that can't possibly be a concern. I mean, the U.S. was, these guys in Washington were supporting massive Iranian and Iraqi casualties in the 80s. Uh, they continued under the, in, through the 90s. Uh, probably uh, Saddam would use chemical weapons, but again, that can't be a concern. We not only supported him when he did it in the past, but continued to aid him in developing more. Uh, so, uh, in fact, as I said, continued to help him develop weapons of mass destruction well after, so that can't be it. And no problems with the UN, you know, you have to go through all that nonsense. Uh, if anybody bothered to stop the liberation of Iraq, the U.S. could veto it as usual, uh, but it wouldn't come up anyway. Uh, it, uh, it, it, there's no question that Iran would be, Iranian troops would probably be welcomed uh, in a large part of the country. Remember, most 60 or 65 percent of the country is Shiite, You're not pro-Iranian, but they're much more likely to be welcoming uh, Iranian troops than U.S. troops. In fact, they'll, on Basra and Karbala, they'll be shouting from the rooftops, uh, thanking the liberators. And we can all join the Iranian journalists who are writing about the liberation and the noble uh, effort and opening a new era of humanitarian intervention. We can all join in on that. Uh, we're spared the embarrassment of pretending that our leaders have suddenly gone through a miraculous conversion for which there isn't a particle of evidence. Uh, we'll have, they'll be able to do much better than we to, in uh, introducing democracy in Iran, in Iraq. I mean, the uh, U.S. is going to have a big problem with uh, making sure that the large majority of the population has essentially no voice. Uh, if we want to talk about the Kurds, they'll be in trouble. But the U.S. has a horrendous record with regard to Kurds, uh, most recently in Turkey. Uh, where the U.S. was uh, right through the Clinton, in the Clinton administration, some of the worst atrocities of the 1990s were being carried out in southeastern Turkey. 
uh, where millions of people were driven from their homes, tens of thousands were killed, every barbaric form of torture you can imagine. In the single year 1997 alone, uh, the Clinton administration sent more arms to Turkey than in the entire Cold War period combined up to the onset of what is called, for example, in the Boston Globe this morning, the counter-terror campaign. The counter-terror is what we call our terrorism, right? So if you read the Globe this morning, there's a little insert about the success of the counter-terror campaign. Yeah, it was this. Uh, so, you know, it, it asking us to save the Kurds, it's not very substantial, and so on. So what's the matter with that? Uh, well, you know, they're, they're, and in fact, why isn't it being discussed? One second. Uh, notice it isn't being discussed, uh, and there's a very good reason for it. It's crazy. I mean, it's totally crazy, but it's just a lot more reasonable than what is being proposed. And in fact, the only, think it through in your spare time, there's only one flaw in this proposal. The flaw is it's not going to leave the United States in control of Iraqi oil, and it's not going to solve the domestic political problems of the reactionary right-wing oligarchy. Other than that, I don't see any flaws in it. Uh, so if those... Uh, you know, I'm going to veer off for one moment. Uh, we have a distinguished fellow here at the Institute of Politics, one Ted Sorensen, and he would like to ask you a question. Professor, you were quite successful a while back in embarrassing the young questioner who didn't have uh, specific citations to back up his uh, questions uh, to you. But when you come to the Kennedy School and attack John F. Kennedy, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In two instances, you, you, you made two instances. First, you tried to charge Kennedy with a speech given by Dean Acheson no. to the international uh, I said a lawyers. senior, remember what I said, a senior advisor of he the He was Kennedy not a senior advisor. He held no position in the Kennedy administration. No, but he was an advisor. And you ought to have He was an advisor, so he was an advisor to the Kennedy administration. No, he was not. Right. The only advice he gave, <laughs> okay, the only ahead. advice he gave, which I quoted on this platform two weeks ago, Kennedy totally rejected. Okay. Secondly, you said Kennedy gave an order to his White House staff to let everything loose against Cuba. I'm no, no that's not what I said. I said to unleash. He never gave any such order. Unleash. If you're talking about Operation Mongoose, that was an operation by the CIA that was not authorized by Kennedy. And in a Cuba conference two weeks ago, speaking to Cubans about Operation Mongoose, I pointed out what Kennedy's actual principles and policies were. And I said to the extent that Operation Mongoose violated its mandate and went beyond Kennedy's policies and principles by inflicting violence, I apologize. Shall Maybe we go through Operation that. Mongoose? The phrase terrors of the earth, uh, I happen to take from uh, the main scholarly source on uh, the U.S. and Cuba, Piero Iglesias' recent uh, study, uh, Conflicting Missions, uh, which is quoting the declassified record and quotes Kennedy as uh, ordering his staff to unleash the terrors of the earth against Cuba because of what I said, its successful defiance of the United States, uh, that, uh, uh, namely the very existence of the regime is a successful defiance of the United States and so on as I quote it. Operation Mongoose was not an Eisenhower administration uh, operation. It was not a, C uh, it was a CIA operation, but you know better than I do that the CIA is just the way that the executive branch maintains plausible deniability. They don't do anything on their own. Uh, this was a Kennedy, not only a Kennedy operation, uh, but it was violent and brutal. Uh, we have an extensive declassified record on that by now. We can go through it if you like. And uh, it um, was going on right up to the Cuban Missile Crisis within, right before it. In fact, uh, one of the Operation Mongoose, uh, well, uh, I won't even go into this, but it continued beyond. And in fact, 10 days before the assassination, uh, Kennedy ordered new oper terrorist operations and more extensive ones. Uh, if you want, I'll cite you the well, sources, let's, let's, uh, but it's all through the, you can't deny it anymore because it's all in the declassified record. I think he wants to make one response to this and then we'll go on to other, but Mr. Sorensen. <laughs> we'll stay here, we'll stay. Do you want to make one response to this, sir? Yes. What we just heard was also false. Shh, shh, shh. 
Go ahead. You want to respond, Mr. Sorensen? Uh, something new? No, I'd be glad if Professor Chomsky will send to me a record in which President Kennedy made such a statement. Well, I'll give you the footnote right now. No, it's, I'm not. In, I want to see an actual well, uh, I, record. You can, you can write a letter to Pierre Iglesias and ask him. Actually, he cites uh, Arthur, Pierre, he Pierre, he Pierre cites Arthur Schlesinger there. in that. Hmm. All right, let's, let's move on. This is probably taken on enough. And as you know, he is one of the leading scholars who deals with these issues. All right. Oh, sure, we do. And I've read the classified record, and so have you, and you let's, know the truth about it. Let's get a little it. order here now. <laughs> this gentleman up here, okay? If you'd like, I'll be happy to send you the, the exact reference. Just, just write me an email, and I'll be happy to send you the exact reference. I can't give you the page in my memory. Yeah. This gentleman. Thank you. Hi, my name is Farooq Hadid. I'm a first year at the Graduate School of Business. Uh, the question that I have actually concerns the Iraq debate, and <laughs> I was. The question I have is, I'd like to know what your thoughts on the, are on the long-term consequences for Arab cohesion and identity in the Sorry, aftermath. Sorry, I didn't get it. The long-term consequences of Arab cohesion, Arab cohesion and identity in the aftermath of a war or further an occupation, a long-term occupation of Iraq. Um, as an Arab, this concerns me because um, I'd like to know what consideration is being given, if any, uh, to preserving the identity and strengthening the nationalism in, in a post-war region. You, you're speaking of the Iraq specifically or the Arab world? Well, I'll start the with the people that are going to get occupied. Well, you know, it's anybody's guess. I mean, once you start a war, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, there's plenty of historical evidence on that. The CIA doesn't know, Rumsfeld doesn't know, I don't know, nobody knows. Uh, you unleash a major war, all kinds of things can happen. Uh, if we look at the historical record for a guide, uh, uh, we know what the US record has been, uh, not only in the Middle East, but right close to home, Latin America, where we've got, uh, as I quoted, the. Kennedy uh, administration declassified record, we've got a policy of 150 years, and we can look at what that's done. Uh, so we can take a look, say, at the country that uh, has had the most, has been the beneficiary, let's say, of the most U.S. intervention in the 20th century, uh, ever since Woodrow Wilson invaded, namely Haiti, uh, which is the poorest country in the hemisphere. And that goes, the intervention goes right through the 90s, supporting terror, in fact, a leading terrorist uh, is now hiding out in Queens, and the U.S. won't extradite him. Emmanuel Constant, head of the group that killed maybe 4,000 people in the early 90s, and everyone knows why they won't extradite him. He's going to spill the beans on U.S. involvement with the uh, terrorist forces. So that's Haiti, the most intervention. Uh, the second most intervention in the 20th century has been Nicaragua, which is now the second poorest country in the hemisphere. Uh, vying with it in second place is Guatemala, which is also vying in second place for most intervention. And we can run through the record. In the Middle East, we have a long record. So in fact, again, the declassified record is extremely illuminating. And it, again, takes some discipline not to look at it. So George Bush, uh, you remember his plaintive question, uh, why do they hate us, because uh, we're so good, and so on and so forth. Uh, he wasn't the first president to ask that question. Uh, that was raised by President Eisenhower in 1958 in internal discussion, uh, where he discussed with his staff what he called the campaign of hatred against us uh, by the people in the Arab world. And the National Security Council uh, gave um, an analysis of it and gave a reasonable answer. Uh, they said it's based on the recognition, I'm mixing up a couple of things from 1958, they're not day after day. Uh, the, in, the, in 1958, the National Security Council pointed out, uh, discussed what they called the recognition in the Arab world that the United States supports uh, harsh and oppressive regimes and blocks democracy and development uh, because of our interest in controlling Near East oil and they recommended more of the same. And it continues right up to the present. We don't have a declassified record from last year, but we have a public record. So after September 11th, some of the better journals, like the Wall Street Journal, to their credit, uh, did try to do some studies of uh, 
uh, opinions of the parts of the Arab world that they care about, the rich people. And so they had a study of what they called moneyed Muslims, meaning bankers and you know lawyers and managers of multinationals and so on, all people who are right involved in the whole American system, you know, no objections to US style globalization or anything else. And they gave the same answers. Uh, as in 1958, they said, yeah, there's, uh, we admire the United States, we like its values, we love its freedom, but we wish you wouldn't deprive us of them. Uh, what we oppose is the U.S. policies of supporting oppressive and brutal governments and blocking democracy and development. I mean, that's now exacerbated by particular policies that didn't exist in the 1950s, but those are constant strains. And you hear it right now. And, you know, Pakistan, Egypt, uh, anywhere you look, same complaints. Uh, so is that a basis for thinking that the democracy is going to be established? Well, you know, again, you can believe in religious conversion and have blind faith in your leaders, but other than that, I don't see any basis. That's this gentleman right here. Um, hi, my name is David Goldstein. I'm in the MPAID program here at Kennedy School. Um, my views tend to fall on the center left in the spectrum of things, but for the sake of discussion, um, you made an interesting point in your talk, which is that the real reason we're going into Iraq, or the administration wants to go to Iraq, is to get the oil. That that's the, this biggest material prize that exists in the world. And I tend to agree with you. I no, think that one it, of the biggest material prizes. One of the biggest. In, in world history. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the State Department, part incidentally. That's not me. Yeah. So if you accept that to be true, which I, I, I do, um, isn't there a certain calculus that someone who's sitting in the shoes of a Condoleezza Rice could make, uh, that they're responsible for the best outcome for American citizens. Uh, and there's an upside of going into Iraq, which is we get this greatest material possession, one of the greatest material possessions in the world history. And there are downsides, which are we upset the international community, and maybe there's more terrorism. And couldn't you envision a calculus mm. where they say, sure, that's the reason. and it's a good reason. Let's do it. What's the flaw in the calculus? Oh, I think that's exactly their calculus. But then we ought to just be honest and say, look, we're a bunch of Nazis. <laughs> so fine, let's just drop all the discussion. You know, we save a lot of trees, and we, we can throw out the newspapers and most of the scholarly literature, and just come out state and straight and tell the truth. You know, say, we'll do whatever we want because we think we're going to gain by it. Uh, and incidentally, it's not American citizens who'll gain. They don't gain by this. It's narrow sectors of power, domestic power that the administration is serving with quite unusual dedication. Yeah, they'll gain. So, you know, Dick Cheney will gain, Halliburton will gain, and so on and so forth. Uh, American high tech industry will gain. Uh, the, uh, so, for example, one of the ways of recycling petrodollars uh, is selling arms. Uh, now, that's misleadingly called uh, the military-industrial complex. But anybody who looks carefully, certainly anybody who works at MIT, where it pays their salaries, uh, knows perfectly well that the military system is, is kind of a cover for high-tech industry. I mean, anyone who's using a computer or telecommunications or the internet or you know gets uh, benefits from automation or uh, containerization, or you just name it, I mean, it's all a lot of it's coming out of the state sector of the economy, which is very dynamic and innovative. Uh, and uh, it operates under the cover of military spending quite often. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so there's kind of gains that sort of dribble down. But if that's what we're interested in, fine, let's just say it instead of all the lying. <coughs> Okay. Gentleman right here. My name is Joe Pace. I'm a freshman from the college. In July of this year, a group of bipartisan senators issued forth what was fortunately an unsuccessful call for regime change in Iran. And since Iran is also a fellow axis of evil state, what do you think the possibility is that this slogan, peace through Baghdad, uh, will turn into peace through Tehran? And if so, what do you think the justifications that we'd fabricate for that would be? Well, actually, I quoted uh, Anthony Cordesman before. Uh, urging the, who remember is a very conservative mainstream military strategist. Uh, uh, he, I quoted him as warning the administration not to follow the sillier arms chair strategists who happen to be right close to power now. And that's what the, one of the things they're calling for. Now, we don't know, here's, here's what, we do know something about this. Uh, uh, Israel has basically become a, virtually a US military base by now. Uh, and as a, it's a small country, but as a U.S., as an offshoot of the Pentagon, more or less, 
Uh, it has an extremely powerful military. According to the IDF analysts, you know, the Israeli army analysts, uh, the Israeli uh, Air Force and Navy are larger and technologically more advanced than those of any NATO power, any other than the United States, of course. Uh, and right now, apparently, um, over 10 percent of the air and naval forces are permanently based in Turkey, uh, in U.S. base, big U.S. bases in eastern Turkey. And armored forces are there, too, presumably to help in case it's necessary to continue the uh, atrocities against the Kurds in the region, if they stand up again. Uh, uh, what are they doing there? Well, according to American scholarly sources, like Robert Olson in the Middle East Policy recently, uh, they're flying over uh, at the Iranian border, uh, looking ahead to the next stage. Iraq's kind of small, you know, you can smash that up easily. Uh, but Iran is big, that's Israel's main enemy, uh, because they know that that's the one country in the region that they can't easily dominate militarily, so they've been trying to get the U.S. to do it for them for years. Uh, and that apparently is going on. Uh, and uh, he and others also report uh, that uh, there are plans in the offing to try to partition, to work to partition Iran, uh, maybe by stripping off the uh, uh, northern um, Azerbaijani regions, mostly Azeri up there, uh, and other plans. Well, you know, how accurate that is, we don't know, but they're certainly thinking about it. And again, if you read the Israeli press, which is very informative on this and quite reliable, uh, particularly has been for a long time, very informative now because of the close connections between the, the, you know, the Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, Pearl circles and the ultra-right in Israel. So they're reporting it extensively. And these are exactly the kind of plans they have in mind, but they're much broader. Um, they also talk about plans to extend the um, Hashemite kingdom, uh, Jordanian kingdom, to part of Iraq and part of Saudi Arabia. Uh, reconstruct the whole region in a kind of an Ottoman style, you know, with the centers of power being in uh, Ankara and Jerusalem, of course, all under the U.S. aegis, and regional, you know, you leave regional affairs to local people, pretty much the way the Ottoman Empire ran. Uh, those are long, those are plans that have been around for a long time. Some of them are on public record. And that's the kind of thing that Cordesman is warning about. Uh, Yevin, too. In fact, he says they're going on to China. You know, uh, that's why uh, 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 there is discussion in the region of the axis of evil. So if you want to quote the semi-official Egyptian press, they do refer to the axis of evil, referring to the U.S., Turkey, and Israel. <laughs> they say that's the axis of evil. Uh, it has an advantage over the one made up by Bush's speechwriters in that at least it's an axis. Uh, it's a real axis. Uh, Iran and Iraq have been at war for 20 years, and North Korea was probably tossed in so it wouldn't look as though it's all against Muslims. But there's certainly no axis there. And there's plenty of evil to go around everywhere we look, so that's not a problem. But the U.S.-Israel-Turkey alliance is very real. Uh, there, it's, uh, I mean, that's part of the reason why the U.S. was supporting the massive atrocities in southeastern Turkey. Uh, in uh, through the 90s and so I was there a few months ago and it's quite something same in Colombia where I also was uh, there's places where you really could stop terrorism by not participating in it so that's real and uh, the Israeli uh, Air Force and Navy are real and maybe these reports are correct they're certainly being discussed in serious places so yeah it's quite possible I'm going to ask, take the prerogative of the chair and ask the last question. I, I found your remarks interesting, frankly, somewhat troubling, because I have difficulty equating the motives of the United States with the motives of other countries in the world that you've kind of put in the same league that I have some difficulty doing. But let me ask you this question. What, if, if you believed that Saddam Hussein had biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons and was imminently going to use them, perhaps not on us, but on his neighbors, and uh, with, the, with the potential of killing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people, uh, would there be any circumstances that you would uh, agree that it would be worthwhile for the U.S. to use military force against him? 
Well, I, as I said, there's better options. For example, letting Iran use military force, which has enormous advantages over letting US use military force, for example, those they mentioned, except for the flaw. It doesn't leave us in control, and it doesn't handle the political problems. Uh, so, but there certainly are cases where uh, it might be possible. Uh, but let me repeat, nobody in the region is worried about it. Isn't that a little surprising? I mean, Kuwait and Iran, for example, both of them invaded by Saddam when he was our ally. Uh, they're not calling for the use of military force. In fact, they're opposing it. Uh, the, the only country in the region that's calling for military force is Israel, and they have their own reasons. Uh, the, uh, uh, the only people who seem to be afraid of this possibility, in fact, even Israeli military intelligence, uh, the head of Israeli military intelligence recently announced that he doesn't, and they watch it pretty closely, uh, that they don't see any nuclear threat from Iraq maybe four or five years from now, but not in the near future. He denied it. Pardon? This, but, and, and furthermore, see, there's a little question. I mean, I'm strongly opposed to allowing Iraq to develop nuclear weapons. That's why when George Bush and uh, number one uh, and his cohorts were providing uh, assistance to Saddam in developing nuclear weapons, I was writing against it and uh, opposing it. I'll give you the citations if you want. That's 1990, 1989, 1988. Yeah, I was strongly opposing the U.S. and British uh, efforts at the time to provide Saddam with uh, the means of developing weapons of mass destruction. I think it was horrifying. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't want it to happen now. And if we're interested in stopping it, yeah, everybody knows the way. You get inspectors back. See, certainly for nuclear weapons, that's going to work. Maybe not for everything else. But just think for a second. Suppose, suppose I had nuclear weapons in my backyard, for instance. Could I, would it be a threat to anyone? Or would it be a deterrent? Well, only under one condition, that I let people know I had them. Okay? If they're hidden in my garage, they're neither a threat nor a deterrent. Right? Everybody knows this. If Saddam Hussein, in the extremely unlikely contingency that he'll develop nuclear weapons, uh, if they were to be usable for every, anything, he'd have to let people know he had them. Well, the minute there's a hint that he has them, Iraq gets obliterated. Okay? Uh, suppose there was any move made towards using them. Well, you know, they get obliterated squared. You know. That's why the people in the region, apart from not believing it, uh, aren't afraid of it, and why they're afraid of the United States. Uh, there are reasons for, uh, there, there are plenty of things to be worried about. So for example, uh, loose nukes getting into uh, the hands of terrorists, that's a problem. And it's not a new one. That predates September 11th. As I mentioned, you can read technical papers in the literature, for example, in the journal International Security, you know, four or five years ago, uh, pointing out that I sort of quoting, close to quoting now, that uh, this is way before 9/11, that uh, the actually citing government studies, which show that, uh, which conclude that uh, a well-planned effort to smuggle uh, weapons of mass destruction, meaning nuclear weapons, into the United States would have a 90% probability of success far higher than any missile attack with or without national missile defense. That's like four or five years ago. If you want a guidebook for terrorists, uh, one was published about four years ago by MIT Press uh, called America's Achilles Heel by uh, three uh, well-known strategic analysts uh, who pointed out all kinds of ways in which uh, uh, terrorists could, you know, people with my limited capacity could carry out uh, major terrorist attacks in the United States. Those things are really problems, and they're not new. And we've all known about them since 1993, at least. I remember in 1993, the offshoots of the groups that were organized by the U.S. in Afghanistan in the 80s uh, almost blew up the World Trade Center. Uh, plus the FBI building, plus the UN buildings, plus the tunnels under the river. They had ambitious plans. According to the World Trade Center building engineers, uh, if they had a little better planning, they would have killed tens of thousands of people. These are not new threats, you know. I mean, it's been known by everyone for years. All you have to do is read the newspapers to know it. If you read the technical literature, it's been all over. Those are problems. Uh, and if we're serious about trying to prevent, say, nuclear explosions in New York, uh, the way you do it is by going after the loose nuke problem. And we know where the problem lies. It lies in the former Soviet Union and in Pakistan. 
uh, and in other places where there's very weak supervision over nuclear weapons. Are we doing anything about it? No, virtually nothing. I mean, very limited funding to try to do something about it. Uh, the latest uh, treaty, so-called, which isn't really a treaty, it's a memorandum of understanding between, uh, Bush, between Russia and the United States on nuclear weapons, it does nothing. It doesn't even reduce the, num reduce the number of nuclear weapons below the level it was already planned, and it provides for no supervision. Uh, same is true of biological weapons. So, for example, just October 23rd, like just a week ago, uh, the... Uh, First Committee of the United Nations, which is basically the General Assembly, uh, passed two resolutions. Uh, one resolution calling for a reaffirmation of the 1925 Geneva Convention opposing the use of, banning the use of chemical weapons. And the second uh, was effectively reaffirmation of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which bans the uh, placing weapons in outer space, which we'll sooner or later call nuclear weapons, passed almost unanimously, two countries opposed, uh, uh, the United States and Israel. It's actually one country because Israel's vote is reflexive. Uh, so one country opposed, the United States. Uh, the US uh, carried out its opposition the way it usually does in these committees, but disarmament committees, by abstaining. Uh, and a US abstention, like a veto, is in fact a double veto. For one thing, it kills the proposal, and for another thing, it bans it from uh, uh, access to the public. So there wasn't a single mention of this in any newspaper in the United States. A friend did a database search, which is normal, that's the way it usually works, on the assumption, I guess, that it's not a good idea to let uh, citizens know of uh, what's being done to end biology's only experiment with higher intelligence. This goes on all the time, but those are real threats. I mean, if we oppose, uh, just shortly before that, the US opposed any steps, any steps, even 10 years in the future, to add some uh, uh, enforcement devices to the biological weapons treaty that the US at the last minute refused to uh, ratify, endorse. Yeah, those are real threats. You know, we want to do something about them. Yeah, put teeth in them. Uh, and carry out our responsibilities under the non-proliferation treaty, which we signed. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty commits those who have nuclear weapons to good faith efforts to get rid of them. Okay, yeah, put teeth in that and stop stimulating the proliferation of nuclear weapons, as Kenneth Waltz pointed out, by countries who are gonna feel they need them as a deterrent. Yeah, those are all concrete things that we can do to increase our own security. Thank you very much, Professor Chomsky.